That's gratifying. I mean, for people who think that our democracy is fragile, which I believe, and are worried about the condition of it, um, we're actually seeing a real life example of democracy taking on totalitarianism. Prominent CEOs, leading economists, iconic investors, insights from the experts. The Walker Webcast with Willie Walker. See who's next. All right. Uh, welcome to my first live Walker webcast with my great old friend, Senator Michael Bennett from the great state of Colorado. I'm honored. I am. Thank you for having me. It's so me. great. So let me do a brief introduction, which isn't really needed, and then we'll dive into it. Uh, Michael F. Bennett is an American businessman, lawyer, and politician serving as the senior United States Senator from Colorado, a seat he has held since 2009. Bennett previously worked as a managing director for the Anschutz Investment Company, chief of staff to the Denver mayor, John Hickenlooper, and superintendent of the Denver Public Schools. So first of all, I love the fact that the description of you has three different careers, businessman, lawyer, and politician. There are not many people who can play in different lanes, if you will. Um, why politics? Well, I also wonder what happened to Mayor Hickenlooper. <laughs> He's now your junior senator from the great state of Colorado. Say that, but that's, you, you said it. Uh, you know, I, I, it's, uh, I feel really lucky to have as checkered a career as I've had, and it's, and it has been checkered. I think it's rare to have the chance to have experience in the private sector, in the public sector, and then end up here without having spent my life in politics. I spent my life outside of politics. And I hope that I've been able to bring some perspective from my business life and some perspective having been the superintendent of the Denver Public Schools most recently before I was in this job that is different from the political experience other people here have had. I don't denigrate that experience. You learn a lot about yourself and a lot about your state and the country when you're running for office, but it's not the only experience that's valuable. You were born in New Delhi, India, um, yet you ran for president of the United States. I thought you had to be born in the United States of America to run president of the United well, States. Well, you have to be a natural born citizen. And I was a natural born citizen because I, um, my parents were US citizens who were working for our embassy in New Delhi. So even though I was born in, in, in New Delhi, I'm a natural born citizen. There may be other barriers to my being president of the United States, uh, but that's not one of them. <laughs> we'll talk about that in a bit. So um, grew up in Washington, DC, St. Albans to Wesleyan University, where your father was president of Wesleyan. After I was there. After you were there, yeah. yeah. That's neat. I mean, so you were the third generation of Bennett's to go to Wesleyan, right? right? Yeah. And, uh, and then you, how'd your dad end up becoming president? Had he, you that him? guy that was his predecessor, in the job was somebody that just had they had hired and he just couldn't connect with the Westland community. And I think Westland decided they wanted somebody who who could connect. And my dad wasn't an academic, but he had a PhD and and he had gone there. And I think that that for a variety of reasons that suited Westland's purposes. And he loved the time that he was there. It was the best job he ever had, I think. And then he, he thought it was the best job. Ever. And then on to Yale Law School, where you were editor of the Yale Law Review. Yeah. Pretty Yale heady Washington. stuff. Yeah, it was a uh, it was the three really the three most luxurious years of my life were in that place. I mean, the hard part was getting in. It was right. really, really hard to get in there. Now it would be impossible to get in there. But once you got in, it was three years of basically doing whatever it was you wanted to do or no, there were a lot of great people there too. I enjoyed it. Isn't it, other than Amy Comey Barrett, everyone on the Supreme Court either went to Harvard or Yale? That was true. Uh, in fact, that may still be true. Yeah. I haven't been tracking it in the last couple. There was a time when half were from Yale and the other half were from Harvard. And, you know, that I think is a shame. I think people ought to come from all over the country, you know, on the court and in the Senate for that matter. I think we've overemphasized Ivy League credentialing. So you, if you will, banged around a little bit of doing some politics, went to work for Dick Celeste out in Ohio, right. 
um, worked for a law firm here in DC. You and your dad actually overlapped in the Clinton administration. Isn't that right? We did. How was that? Yeah, well, I was trying to escape from my law firm, which was, you know, a good law firm in Washington, DC. You were but, working for Lloyd Cutler. Yeah. Yeah. And I actually literally was working for him. I mean, on a case with him. And still, I didn't like, I just didn't like practicing, you know, at a big firm like that. So I left to go work for Jamie Gorelick, who is then the deputy attorney general. And that was, um, the same time my dad was working in the uh, State Department for, for President Clinton, Bill Clinton at that time. Would you ever see him? No. no. Well, I'd see him. I'd see him Around. socially. Yeah, yeah, socially, but not, 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 not from not, a work standpoint. Not, not from a work standpoint. And so you head west and end up meeting Susan when you're living in Montana? No. we. So I, uh, I really liked the job at the Justice Department, but I um, it kind of was coming to an end. I went back up to New Haven to be in the U.S. Attorney's Office up there on a kind of a special detail. And I just reached the conclusion that I wasn't put on this earth to practice law. I just didn't enjoy it. I knew a lot of people who did. One was Susan, my, who, whom I had met in Washington. And But four months after we met, she announced that she was going to move to Montana. So it was it was too, it was too, let's see, how do I, it was too early in the relationship to say, don't move. And it was right. too late in the relationship to say, you know, see you later. So I actually drove her out there. I spent four months there, ran out of money and then, and then came back here and went to work at the law firm. We got to Denver because she got a job offer from the same group that um, she had worked for in in uh, Montana, which was the Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund. It's now called Earth Justice. And I, um, until about a week or 10 days before I was getting married on October 25th of 1997, I was unemployed, which was not the condition that I wanted to show up at my wedding in Marianna, Arkansas with, but Phil Anschutz hired me. I was me just gonna say, so then you got a to- A week before How did you wedding. end up, how'd you get to Phil? Uh, I sent two letters to Colorado that actually one is one is here. I'll show it to you. I sent two letters to Colorado. One was to John Hickenlooper, who had been recommended. Oh, because he went to Wesleyan? He had gone to Wesleyan. And I and I met a guy named David Skaggs, who was a congressman from Boulder, who was a client at the law firm where I was working. And he had gone to Wesleyan, he had gone to Yale Law School, and he said, I'd you know, I, I know this guy, John Hickenlooper, and you should send him your letter. I got no reply from John Hickenlooper. I'd sent another letter to Phil and um, uh, and he wrote back and he called me back and he said, I understand you want to get out of the law. Why don't you come here and talk to me? So I flew on my nickel, of course, to Denver and stayed at the Comfort Inn on, you know, next to the Anschutz headquarters on my nickel. And and he he hired me, which was. Shocking. I remember I remember you and I had lunch in Denver when you were working on the Regal Cinemas roll up, I guess, or yeah, buyout. Yeah, or yeah. You were you were buying debt on Regal Cinemas, which is now part of AMC. Is it part of that? No, role? it's separate. It is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's been that meme stock that just kind of keeps on well, yeah. kept on going for a period of time. And Adam Aaron, who used to run Vale Resorts, is running AMC. That's right. I saw Adam not that long mm -hmm. ago, and listen to the tale of that crazy meme stock. It's, it's, it's really nuts. I'm not in that business anymore, obviously, but I, but it was an amazing opportunity. I mean, it was um, three really significant movie theater operations. It was $3 billion of debt, which we, you know, I bought pennies on the dollar and the sub debt, the bank debt from United Artists, Edwards and Regal Cinemas. And we created what was at that time the largest motion picture exhibitor in the world. And we took the $3 billion of debt down to $400 million of debt. And the thing just spat cash. It was unbelievable. It's so great. So I'm going to run through the next two stops because I want to get into the meat of some issues going on here now before you've got to run off and go vote. Uh, so to John Hickenlooper as his chief of staff as mayor of, of Denver, then you become the head of the school board, the Denver public school system. And you run that very successfully. And then when Ken Salazar goes into the Obama administration, you get appointed by the governor to be the senator from Colorado. Um, I'll never forget the day that you got sworn in. And I was in the observation deck up above. And all the senators lined up and shook your hand after you'd gotten sworn in. 
take me back to that moment because I have to tell you, as a as an outsider, just watching that was just the history and the the sense of just formality and practice and everything that makes this body what it is just kind of shown in that moment to me. I mean, to I have to go back to the appointment to begin with because that's I was appointed. I was a school superintendent, and all of a sudden I was appointed to the U.S. Senate. That doesn't happen very often, and you know, in in at least maybe not in retrospect, but prospectively, a lot of people thought Bill Ritter, our governor, was crazy for having made the appointment that he made. And I certainly, um, you know, and like reading headlines like WTF exclamation point, exclamation point. <laughs> that which, feels good. Yeah, that really makes you feel good. <laughs> and it is, you know, just like any starting anything new, you know, there's a, if you're a decent human being, I think you have a sense of, you know, how did I get here? And and who am I to represent all these people? Now, 13 or 14 years later, I don't think there's anybody in the state who's, you know, visited more of the state than I have had more town halls or conversations or, you know, and I feel home everywhere there, which is a, that's a great joy personally for me, because I love the state and it's a beautiful place. And I think it's a crucible of American politics. Like I think that Colorado's politics are really America's politics. Um, that day, you know, was um, it was a pretty amazing thing because you're seeing these people on TV all the time, and now all of a sudden you're sitting there and they're sitting across the table from you, and there's John Kerry eating red Jello, yeah. you know, for for dessert. And you're like, what is you know, this is crazy. But Willie, I've thought a lot about um, what attributes these people all have in common, you know, there are 100 people, there have only been 2000 people in the history of our country that have been in the Senate, 330 million Americans and 100 people on the floor. And my conclusion is that it's luck, you know, that, that it may be bad luck, not necessarily good luck, but it's luck uh, that have has put us here. And I think that that ought to give us a little bit of grace when we're dealing with. You know, so that first election campaign, you go from never having run for anything before to, I mean, heavyweight prize fight. I mean, if you will, I mean, it's just like you're thrown right into the deep end of the pool. Talk for a moment about that campaign against Ken Buck, because you won it. But I mean, you've gone from zero to 60 as far as putting together a campaign staff and learning how to campaign. Now you're old hat at it and you know how to do it quite well. But back then didn't have any idea. I had 3% name ID and and the longer 3% that was it at the beginning, 3% name. <laughs> wow. And, and, and I had never run a campaign. I had no idea. And, uh, but um, I had an amazing team of people. I hired an incredible campaign manager, Craig Hughes. I hired an amazing chief of staff here, a guy named Guy Cecil, who told me today that he, you know, he was meeting me for dinner, that there's no way that he would ever come work with me. And he did. I would have lost that campaign if it hadn't been for his willingness to do that. And as the year developed, it became a horrible year for Democrats. I mean, I was voting for the Affordable Care Act. You know, I had town hall after town hall after town hall in rural Colorado with this deck of slides that I put together myself, trying to explain to people it's part of your why finance I had, background. Why, I like, yeah, why I like I having the PowerPoint. Used, and also, you had used the same stuff when I was closing schools in, in the Denver Public Schools, and now I was trying to explain. You know, here's why. I voted the way I voted, and and I and I think, in the end, I survived a really terrible year for Democrats. In part because Ken, who's a friend of mine now and a member of the delegation, you know, found himself a little expressing a, a somewhat more right wing view than probably Colorado was was going to be comfortable with, and. Um, and I showed up everywhere, you know, and we did what we were supposed to do. I, I was, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure I've ever worked as relentlessly in my, and most of that was about trying to protect Bill Ritter's honor. You know, I wanted to demonstrate that his decision to put me in the job sure. to begin with hadn't been a stupid one. And then in 16, um, when Trump won, you won by five points. Yeah. Another, another. Granted, that, I mean, it, but I mean, five points is a wide yeah, margin. Yeah. You won handily that yeah. time. Yeah, but another tough year in, in Colorado, you know, while Trump was winning Pueblo County by 10, I was winning Pueblo County by 10. Yeah. And and so managed to survive again. And now I picked another terrible year to run. <laughs> um, so 
talk for a moment. You're on ag finance and intelligence, right? right? And so on ag for a moment, uh, natural resources, water. Yesterday, you and I flew east and Senator Tester was on the plane with us. Right. And I asked him about Montana and he said he's never seen a drier right. winter in his, entire, yeah. in his entire farming life. He says he's never seen less water. And we got a real issue on water in the West. Yeah, he and I spend a lot of time talking about that. The crisis is is extraordinary. I mean, in Colorado, we had the three worst fires in the state's history two years ago. Last year, we didn't have a fire. We had smoke. In fact, I was at your house. Yeah. Uh, you know, we had yeah. smoke uh, for a lot of that year that obscured the, the mountains. You couldn't see them, you know, and nobody lives in Colorado, so they can't see the mountains. There were days when there were health warnings because people couldn't go out. We had the worst air quality in the world, as did Utah One you know, on one day of that year that led me and Mitt Romney to take a rafting trip together on the Colorado River. But we didn't have a fire until the day before New Year's Eve when more than a thousand families in Boulder County lost their houses the day before New Year's to a brush fire. It's destroyed, you know, everything that they had ever worked for. And so, and the Colorado River is empty. I mean, you can just go on and on and on. One of my great frustrations is that I think we've done a terrible job, those of us that are advocates for doing so, about climate change, have done a terrible job of trying to explain to the American people what this transition is actually gonna look like, you know? And that's right. made it that's made it hard for us to get over, you know, this hurdle or, or to put it another way, it's made it very easy for like, say, look, Joe Manchin to be able to flick us away with his little finger and not even break a sweat. And we that's we just have to do a better job. And I think people that are representing the West where we are seeing a kind of, you know, dramatic reduction in water resources and, and in fires. I mean, we've got to make sure that we're elevating our voice here to, to get anything done. So on finance, um... Was Jerome Powell's confirmation came to finance or is that banking? It was banking. That's banking. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you voted to, for him to be confirmed yeah. as, for another term as Fed chair. What's your take of the U.S. economy right now? Well, what, what's my take? Well, you know a lot better than I do, but I'll give you my take. I'm I mean, asking. I'll give you my take. Actually, I, 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 um, uh, I think that um, obviously we're, mad, we're facing serious you know, inf of inflationary pressures. Uh, I think I had a conversation with Chairman Powell not, not that long ago about, you know, my concerns that the the length of the Fed's intervention, the, the size of quantitative easing, the zero rates for as long as we had them, we're having it partly, you know, in addition to the scarcity of housing that we have in Colorado and the, and, um, the fact that Colorado is a place that people want to live. That, that one other unintended consequence of these interventions, which is not to say whether they were right or whether they were wrong, is that housing prices are just going through the roof in Colorado. Asset inflation is just unbelievable. And you know, even before we were in the inflationary period we're in today, if I had to summarize my last 14 years of town hall meetings, it's really, really easy to do it. It's people coming and saying, um, we're working really hard, we're killing ourselves, and no matter what we do, we can't afford some combination of housing, healthcare, higher education, or early childhood education. You know, if we can even find early childhood education, because no early childhood educator can afford to live in Colorado. You know, we we can't save. And to me, that's an anecdotal reflection of an economy that for 50 years has worked really well for the top 10% of Americans and hasn't really worked for anybody else. And I think we've got a real opportunity to ask ourselves right now with the realization about you know, the, the mistakes, the, the misjudgments that we've made about what China's participation in the global economy would look like. I think we have a real opportunity to think about instead of you know, how we think about privileging people that wanna make stuff as cheaply as possible in China over everything else, we start thinking about how we create an economy that can protect our it create supply chains. We can uh, onshore manufacturing with the kind of energy prices that we have in this country, and uh, and uh, I just I just think there's a real opportunity here that President Obama didn't pursue, President Clinton didn't pursue, President Trump didn't pursue, 
that can allow us to try to create an economy that, that when the economy grows, it grows for everybody, not just the people at the very top, because I don't think the democracy can sustain this level of income inequality and this level of economic mobility for another 50 years. I don't, I think it's impossible. You talked about early childhood education, something that you've been very involved with. Um, what happens to Build Back Better? Is it dead? I think it's going to be very hard to get it over the finish line. Probably, um, if it does get over the finish line, probably the stuff that will remain are the climate provisions, which I think are important provisions. But, you know, I'm deeply disappointed that we didn't create a more coherent package. Uh, and, you know, obviously the, the piece that I led was the enhanced child tax credit and the enhanced earning income tax credit. That's two, that's one of those is Bennett Brown and the other one is Brown Bennett. There's one I like better than the other, but they were, you know, Joe Biden's very significant tax cut for working people and the child tax credit itself meant that families were getting 450 bucks a month to help pay the rent, to, to feed their kids, to, um, to pay for a little extra daycare so they could actually stay at work. And man, with these inflationary pressures costing families, you know, on average three hundred dollars, if they had that four hundred and fifty bucks now, that would have made a big difference. And I couldn't persuade Joe Manchin that it wasn't welfare, or or, and I couldn't persuade him of what's been true everywhere else. It's got a child allowance like the one we have, which is that that the countries that have those have higher workforce participation rates than we have, and we've now experimented with that, you know, for six months in America, and we saw that people were not disincentivized from working, they work. Right. Um, intelligence, uh, Ukraine, Russia, obviously there are things that you see on the intelligence committee that you can't talk about, but I'm just, I'm curious as it relates to just insight into the conflict and being a third party to the conflict and that line of potentially getting pulled in, yeah. staying on it. I, I, my take of the Biden administration's policy has been pretty fantastic yeah. to threading a very thin needle here. Michael, what's your take on that? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, first of all, on the committees, let me just say one of the reasons it's not, one of the reasons I like ag is that it's not partisan. We have regional differences. We don't have partisan differences. The intelligence committee also, you know, we, we're meet in secret and yeah. the partisanship that stuff finance is brutal on that score <laughs> generally but but i do think it was an amazing place to be for the last 18 months watching putin build up his troops uh, around ukraine and frankly watching him make some really fundamental mistakes because partly because of who he is but partly because of the design of his society. I'm a huge believer in democracy and I'm more, notwithstanding all the dysfunction that I've seen since I've been here, which is staggering levels of dysfunction compared to what I would expect. I actually believe more in democracy today than I did the day I walked into this place. And what Putin has just done is, is a real demonstration of why totalitarianism is a terrible way for humans to organize themselves. Nobody gave him the bad news about, about the condition of his army. You know, and, and, and how poor the buildup had been. Nobody told them that the Ukrainians were going to fight back. We knew they would. We didn't know exactly what would happen. We thought Putin was going to be in Kiev in 72 hours, but we thought that he was going to have an insurgency basically forever, that the right. Ukrainians would never give up. Well, we turned out to be a lot righter than he was. And then the third piece of it um, was, I think he deeply underestimated what the global community was going to be. And I, and I, and I do think the president deserves credit there. I'll say the folks that do deserve the real, the most credit are the Ukrainian people and their bravery has been so inspiring to democracies around the world that it's just, it's amazing to see people all over the free world, you know, saying to people like me, you got to do more, you got to do more, you got to do more, you know, and that's gratifying I mean, for people who think that our democracy is fragile, which I believe, and are worried about the condition of it, um, we're actually seeing a real life example of democracy taking on totalitarianism. And then the final point is the balance. You know, when we have something like this, everyone in Congress becomes a general. You know, right. we all are the experts on whether you should put planes in or not put planes in, or should you, you know, and, and what, what is Putin going to view as you know, escalatory and not escalatory. And you know what the truth is, just like any human endeavor, 
it's all iterative, you know, you can't predict it all. And you have to be, what you got to do is you got to have really good people. You've got to uh, every day check where you are on the line in terms of, you know, inadvertently putting this in a World War III kind of situation or not. And you got to get right up to that line. And I think, I think the Biden administration working with our allies has really done a good job of that. And Zelensky has done a an excellent job of um, leading and and uh, and the, and it's just you can't say enough about what the Ukrainian people are doing. I mean, they are for the moment, you know, I think beating Russia. Yeah, very much. It so. may not end up that way. I hope it does end up that way. Um, the Roe v. Wade leak from the Supreme Court. You think that that has a big impact on the November elections? Well, I first I'll say I think it's really unfortunate that it leaked as a lawyer. I, I think those are the kind of you know institutional conventions that are that you wish people would would pay attention to. Like I'm, you know, it bums me out that our um, constitutional responsibility here to advise and consent has been turned into just one more raw partisan exercise. When I was in law school, every time a judge got 95 or 98 votes when they went on the court, we reaffirmed the independence of the judiciary. Did you know, Bork, it, did the Bork was, hearings change all that forever? It, well, that, it was, it, it certainly was the beginning of the end, but yeah. there was also, you know, there was a moment when, when people started to filibuster uh, circuit court judges, which had never happened before. And, you know, it went tit for tat, tit for tat, till McConnell finished it off, you know, with with uh, with Gorsuch. Um, I think that, uh, you know, this is 50 years of a relentless uh, effort to reverse Roe versus Wade. I can't predict the effect it's going to have in the midterms, but I will say this, it's now incumbent on those of us that believe in a woman's right to choose to make sure that we've got a pro-choice choice majority in the House and a pro-choice majority in the Senate, you know, and whether we're voting for Democrats or Republicans, we need to be voting for people that believe in in enshrining that right uh, in the statute book, since it's no longer going to be in the Constitution. Um, guns, you're a gun owner. Yeah. You have a shotgun. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you're from a Western state. Right. Um, but have voted in 2013 against the, um, it was Diane Feinstein who proposed the right. uh, uh, assault weapon right. ban, yeah. which you voted against, yeah. and yet you are for um, universal background checks. Right. And right. kind of, I mean, Buffalo, we've got 10 more people killed. Colorado has had yeah. tragic history as it relates to I mean, it's gun terrible. violence. It's terrible. I, I have three daughters, as you know. The oldest one, Caroline, was born the year after Columbine. So Columbine my so kids, well. yeah, you remember right where right so distinctly. You were exactly where I was. Yeah, yeah. yeah was it's like 9 11. I was walking same thing. through the Houston airport, working for Phil, and yeah. and we were, and um, and uh, and so my kids, like so many kids in America, have grown up in the shadow of gun violence in, in our country in ways that you and I did not grow up, in ways that no other generation of Americans, or I would say anybody living in the industrialized world is gone. You could fail states, you can, there are failed states where kids have to worry about gunfire as much as they ha have to here, but no other, you know, civilized country. And, um, and I did vote against Diane's bill because it was, a, I thought it was an obsolete approach. It was an old approach. But I think, you know, uh, background checks would be an important thing for us to do. Uh, 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 having you also bump stocks. Yeah, and also um, high capacity magazines. I mean, there are things that we can do. And Colorado is, as you say, is a Western state. And with our friend John Hickenlooper's leadership, we've addressed some of these issues. I mean, we, we passed background checks in Colorado after, after the Aurora movie theater shooting, which was just so catastrophic for our state. We, um, we limited the size of magazines and, you know, it's impossible for me. I, I go down to the floor here all the time and I say, you know, come down here and tell me how you can say Colorado is less safe having, having background checks in place that prevent every year a handful of people from buying guns who are convicted felons, who are, you know, murderers, domestic abusers. Right. It's impossible to make that case. So I think you're being called for a vote. 
Yes. Oh, we do. We have a little more time. All right. So I was going to jump because I thought this was my last question to you, but I was going to jump to who's the Democratic nominee in 2024 and who is the Republican nominee in 2024? I think that you'd have to say that Donald Trump is the likely Republican nominee and Joe Biden is the likely Democratic nominee. Interesting. Um, you, th you think the president will run for re-election? I don't know. I mean, I, I know don't, you don't I know. Think you're I'm just, just asking me. I know. Who, and I and I look at the list of people, you know, that I that everybody publishes from time to time. And um, I would say of all the people on that list, he's likelier to be the nominee in 2024 than anybody else. You talked about when you first came in, the name recognition when you ran for re-election at the beginning, the 3% of Coloradans knowing who you were. When in 2019, you went on the floor of the Senate and gave a speech talking about the shutting down of the government and the impact of it and basically saying to Ted Cruz in 2013, you voted for a shutdown right. and a Democratic uh, administration that caused significant damage, don't kind of turn the tables. And that video went viral and was the most watched, it may still be the most watched C-SPAN video ever. <laughs> um, talk for a moment about seeing that happen on something that you've done. In other words, you obviously have a high profile job. Yeah. Lots of people know you are. I traveled to the East Coast with you yesterday and walking through the airport, everyone knows who you are. But what was it like when that truly went viral where millions and millions of people are watching it? I think it hit a nerve. I mean, I what for me, it was an amazing moment just personally because I was not intending on doing it. I was just sitting on the floor uh, uh, and next to Doug Jones, my colleague from Alabama, who spent the whole time looking like this, like I was a crazy person. But I listened to Ted Cruz and the guy just, he goes out there and dissembles and dissembles and dissembles. You know, he did it again uh, on, on the 6th of January, you know, when he, when he stood up on the floor and he said how we were disrespecting Donald Trump's supporters by certifying the election when my view was it was exactly the opposite. Ted Cruz was disrespecting people by not telling them the truth about what had happened in the election and that he owed them the truth. It was the same kind of thing that day. And I just kind of lost my mind because I had had enough of it. And I knew how what it, what it had felt like to people in Colorado in 2013 when he was shutting the government down while we were basically under a 500 year flood in my state. And by the way, when people of every single political stripe were coming together to actually get the job done, you know, and, yeah. and, and do their work at the local level. And that's the way I think that this place ought to be like that. I'm not naive. I mean, we've got, you know, we have partisan differences, but if we are, if we really think that this democracy is going to succeed as a perpetual game of shirts and skins. I think that's totally impossible. It cannot happen where you substitute, substitute your, you know, preferred version of one party rule for my version of one party rule. That's not the way this is supposed to work. You know, the way this is supposed to work is, and this is the, this is the genius of democracy. The way this is supposed to work is, it is not that we are supposed to agree with each other. That is not why the founders created a republic, a democratic republic. They created it on the theory that we would disagree with each other because there was no king or tyrant to tell us what to think. And out of those disagreements, out of those clashes, we would create not shabby compromises, but more imaginative and durable proposals than any king or tyrant could come up with on their own. And if this place can't operate that way, then the country can't operate that way. And if the country can't operate that way, we're gonna have a very hard time competing with Beijing, you know, just to pick one example. And I think if we do figure out how to unlock the genius of this pluralistic system, there's not a country in the world we're not gonna be able to compete with. Well, on that system, you need to go vote. Um, thank you. Senator, Thank you it's a real pleasure. You. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, hope you enjoyed this conversation with Senator Bennett and we'll be back next week with another Walker webcast. Thanks very much.